So I'm going to talk about the Coco C++ performance portability ecosystem. And uh, that is essentially our way of, you know, we, can't, we don't have time to wait until 2026 when the C++ standard has all the capabilities we need to implement our applications. So why did we start with this? There is this industry estimate out there that, uh, you know, typical production kind of developer can write 10 lines of code, production code, per hour. That means you get about, you know, 20,000 lines of code per year out of a full-time developer. Uh, that's great. An optimistic estimate is when we switch from kind of one parallel programming model to another parallel programming model, you know, say we would go from uh, OpenMP to CUDA or whatever, we need to touch about 10% of our application uh, to do that. Most of our applications are on the order of 300,000 to 600,000 lines of code. It's pretty, you know, uniform across the board. Uh, that means, you know, just switching parallel programming models takes us two to three many years. We are maintaining a couple dozen of those guys, and on top of that, we maintain a couple of, you know, rather large uh, uh, scientific libraries, in particular Trillinos, that's like four million lines of uh, math code and solver code and other stuff, and that's something we maintain. That, and that would take us like 20 men years just to switch over. And given the costs and overhead of, you know, a staff position at the labs, that's a lot of money. Uh, so why is that a problem? The problem is that we have all these applications, we have all these frameworks and stuff like that, and all of these things need to target all of these different architectures uh, we have underneath, right? There is, there is things like uh, the Oren Oak Ridge Summit and the Livermore S uh, Sierra system with the V100s. We have to run on Trinity, which is like KNL and uh, Intel Haswell. Uh, on Monday, we announced that we're going to buy the Aurora machine at Argon, which is going to be Intel CPUs plus Intel GPUs, and probably that's also not programmed with CUDA. Uh, and then we have at Sandia the biggest uh, ARM machine, uh, Astra, which is uh, we also need to target. So if we don't have something to help here, every one of these apps is going to target every one of these things you know, on their own in some way. Everybody is going to choose their programming model and so on and so on. That is not really sustainable. So what we said is, okay, we need to put something in the middle. That everybody writes to that something in the middle, and then that something in the middle maps to all these different architectures. And that is what Cocos is. I'm going to talk a bit about you know, the Cocos ecosystem, what's in there, what what kind of abstractions and capabilities do we have? In particular, I'm going to talk also uh, you know, shortly about Cocos kernels. Um, then I'll go a bit to uh, talk about some new capabilities in Cocos. We've not been talking here before about uh, much, in particular, the uh, NVLink and NVSHMEM stuff we've been experimenting with from NVIDIA. I'll talk a bit about fine-grained tasking on GPUs, which we uh, improved quite a bit over the last year. Uh, and then I'll show you some Cocos application, uh, some results, you know, some performance results, uh, before ending up with connecting effectively back to the talk, to the previous talk, and tell you, you know, where are we going? You know, how do we interact with the C++ standard? What's the plan of how this works together? So, what is Cocos? Cocos is a C++ programming model, uh, foremost, uh, for performance portability. It's implemented as a template library on top of, as in C++, on top of like CUDA, OpenMP, uh, Rockem for AMD GPUs, etc. It aims to be descriptive, not prescriptive. So you tell us what you want to do, right? And we choose how we do it on these different architectures. Uh, and we're trying to align it with where the C++ standard is going. Cocos is also an expanding solution for common needs of modern science and engineering applications. It's not just enough to have a programming model, right? There's a reason that NVIDIA was really successful with CUDA, and that reason is not just that they have a CUDA programming model, but that we also have math libraries and all these utility things, et cetera. And uh, that's something we need as well. It's open source, it's maintained and developed on GitHub, so you actually can see everything which is going on, you know, every single commit to it, you know, happens there. Uh, it's under BSD license, so it's something which is compatible with using in commercial products. And we have quite a few users from rather many uh, institutions using it already. And this is kind of a sketch, you know, how this looks right now. 
We have Cocos Core, which is the programming model, which is the data abstractions and for parallel execution abstractions. Then we have Cocos Kernels on top of it, which is, which is kind of a blast kernels, linear algebra, uh, graph, some graph kernel stuff, etc. We have Cocos Support, which uh, is funded by ECP, which is a separate project, you know, which organizes boot camps and stuff like that. Uh, does app support, develops tutorials, etc. And then we have Cocos Tools, which is like uh, hooking into the Cocos ecosystem to provide you know, profiling, debugging support, et cetera, and interact, you know, forward information from our runtime to, for example, uh, other people's profiling tools. Something new I'll talk a little bit about is Cocos Remote Spaces. That's essentially gonna be things like uh, PGAS support and also IO interaction potentially. Yeah, and then all of that maps down to all these different architectures, and on top of that then sits, you know, our, uh, our big scientific libraries and our application codes and so on and so on. So who was developing that? Uh, it was started at Sandir, was started by Carter, who left us and went to NVIDIA. Uh, on the other hand, that allowed me to now be in control and finally have the last word, uh, which I found, you know, exhilarating. Uh, people skills. Yeah, people skills, exactly. People skills are so much easier when you're in charge. Uh, but we are expanding the, the development team now to a number of other labs. So Los Alamos has been collaborating with us quite a bit already. Uh, and we are now going to get uh, explicit developer time at Argon and Oak Ridge, in particular to support their machines, but also to support more of the uh, open science applications there. Then there's the Cocos Core team, uh, which is you know, reasonably large. Uh, there's the Cocos Kernels, the Cocos Tools, and uh, some support stuff. Uh, Fernanda Furter, who also you know, started up with us, the Cocos support also left for NVIDIA. Apparently, that's a career path not too uncommon. OK, what are our main abstractions on core, on the programming model? Basically, what we said is we need two kind of things, right? We need parallel execution abstractions and we need data abstractions. The parallel execution abstraction is something you find in other programming models quite a bit. Uh, you know, it has something about execution spaces, so you can tell it, you know, where to execute things on the GPU, on the CPU, or wherever. Uh, most other models only have two, like, you know, if you think about OpenMP target, it has a host and a test device. In Cocos, that's actually more arbitrary because it's, you know, a type-based thing in C++. So you could envision that you have a system where you have, you know, like in your phone, five or six or seven different things, you know, where you can execute. And that's something we think might be important in the future. Um, whereas execution patterns, that's kind of like the parallel algorithms, you know, it's like uh, Perl or the basis of a Perl algorithms, like Perl 4, Perl reduce, Perl scan, and stuff like that. There's a task stack in there, you know, you can task spawn things. And then there's execution policies, and these execution policies are a little bit different than what the C++ ones are. We don't, don't just say, you know, do something in parallel, but we also tell, you know, how to do something. So what is the iteration space, for example, right? Do you give to each iteration actually, you know, every iteration is just done by one thread, or you say, oh, an iteration is actually what uh, I give to like a team of threads, say, say a CUDA block, so that I can do nested parallelism in that. Uh, all of that, you know, is kind of there in a lot of programming models. What isn't quite there is, I think, the data abstractions where we have gone quite a bit further than other people. Uh, so one of the things is memory spaces. That's essentially where you can allocate things. And it's not just, you know, host device. It's also kind of allocation mechanisms. So for example, you know, uh, you can switch between memory allocated page pinned, you know, versus memory which can page migrate and, and so on. Uh, there's memory layouts. That's something which is a core concept in our data abstraction. And that essentially says, you know, oh, I can tell you how to map indices of like multidimensional arrays to underlying storage. So we saw in that previous example, this 2D thing, you know, where we said, oh, I need to do uh, from times n plus uh, two. And that would actually here just be, you know, uh, from comma two. And you choose what the layout is, if it's column major, row major, or whatever. And then there's memory traits, and that's essentially a thing which tells you how to access things. So that allows us to support like atomics, it allows us to support accesses via, say, the texture fetches on GPUs and stuff like that. 
Core capabilities, I'll just plot it a couple here, you know, to give you a feel for that. You know, you have this parallel four thing, you give it a number, you give it a, a loop body, you know, like in the parallel algorithms. There's parallel reductions, uh, there's, you know, multidimensional range policies which allow you to, you know, iterate over a 3D or 4D or 5D space. Uh, there's non-tightly nested loops, so you can start with what I said earlier, right? You start with a team policy and you tell it, oh, I want dynamic scheduling because all my teams will do like different amount of works, right? So I need to, uh, I need to, you know, give the scheduler some flexibility. But then what you get is you don't get an index, you get a team handle, and with that team handle, you can now say, oh, I have nested work and I want to parallelize that nested work with just the threads which belong to that particular team. Uh, you have this task, uh, task spawn stuff, and then our data allocation, we have this, this view, that's our main abstraction, and I'll talk a bit at the end about how this goes in the C++ standard. A two-dimensional view with a specific layout in a specific memory space. You can do explicit deep copies, and then there's things like, you know, atomic ads, et cetera, uh, uh, and also all the other atomics, and then a lot of execution spaces. Uh, there's tons of other capabilities I'm not talking about. Uh, a lot of data structures, you know, things like unordered map, for example, is something we provide because people found that useful. Uh, there's things, you know, which support scatter add patterns, et cetera, in uh, various ways, and so on. Uh, this slide I wrote during the last talk. This is the uh, traveling salesman example. You know, we had this reduction thing, right? And basically what you do here is you just replace that for loop with a parallel reduce and uh, then told it at the end, you know, you want a min reduction across the whole thing. And that's good. Uh, just an example. I'm going through a different example now. That was actually originally in the talk. Uh, so this is a rather complicated example. So this is an example with like nested loops. And I'm going to show you uh, uh, this sparse matrix vector multiply because it's really important in our application. So this is this is, if, if there's one math operation, you know, you have to optimize for our codes, then this is it, right? That's, that's a thing which might use up to 20% on our, uh, on, on the NNSA uh, systems, right, in terms of cycles. So what does this do? In the sparse matrices, right, you store not all the entries in the matrix, you only store like the entries which are actually valid, right, which is typically very few, right? So you have a, your global problem might be a billion rows and a billion columns, but each of these rows only has like 27 entries, right? Uh, so how you store that is you essentially store offsets for each row, you know, where do you start? You, you store explicitly what is the column indices for each entry, which is actually non-zero. So what you do is you loop over all the rows. See, you loop over all the rows, and then what you do is you figure out where does this row start and where does it end, and then you do essentially a dot product of you know that row with a with a right hand side vector. But important is you access the right hand side vector indirectly, right? You have this column index there, so the right hand side vector with x is accessed, you know, through like a gather kind of pattern. So what I'm going to show you now is this is the code which last time I checked, probably, you know, like one and a half years ago or whatever, was beating Kuspars on NVIDIA GPUs and beating MKL on Intel KNL and Haswell for our problems, right? This is the full code, and you compile exactly that, right, for each of these architectures, and it works. So what did we do here? Uh, a couple things. So first, you start, you, you chunk your kind of, you chunk your rows into like row chunks, right? You say, oh, I give, I want it to be, you know, 20 rows or 50 rows or 100 rows, you know, in chunks. And then you start this team policy thing. That's essentially saying, I want a team of threads to work on each of these chunks of rows, right? This team of threads on CPUs might actually be just one thread per team, right? So every thread gets its own chunk of rows. On a GPU, this team, this team, each team is like a CUDA block, okay? Um, I tell this CUDA block, in this case, uh, where's this auto there? So basically I tell it, choose what your, what you think is the best kind of team size, block size for this. The only other thing where I say there is this eight, and that's essentially how many CUDA threads form what we call a Cocos thread. So how many CUDA threads are here, like your vector lane? 
And that's what we're going to use at the last level of a, uh, of a parallelism. Then we loop over all the rows in that row chunk, split over the cocos threads, and we'll do a dot product with what we call the thread vector range. So that would be like a vectorized reduction on CPUs, or on CUDA it would now be, you know, uh, every quarter of a warp, right, gets its own like parallel reduce here, right? So it's, it's eight, eight threads. And that does this dot product, right? Again, it's just a parallel reduce. It's like the normal parallel reduce, right? Just you give it an execution policy, you give it lambda and place where to store. One other trick we do here is we enable, uh, with that little memory traits random access and the const up there, we say, oh, I, I randomly access X, I do gather operations. This is actually faster if I stick it in texture fetches, in particular on Kepler, right? That little memory traits random access type change there makes all of this X come through texture fetches instead of writing, you know, a page of CUDA code. Um, what that, why that works is because, you know, this, this little abstraction of views can essentially return uh, not just a double, it can return some meta type. And that allows us to stick effectively any kind of intrinsics, any kind of like special load paths, you know, underneath uh, what Coco's view does, right? So if your architecture has a special way of loading data through something, uh, then we can support that. So what does Cocos kernels do? Cocos kernels is, uh, you know, blast and sparse and graph kernels on top of Cocos and its view abstractions. It's scalar type agnostic, so, you know, you can instantiate, all of these things are templated, so you can instantiate it even for weird types. So we instantiate our kernels, our blast, for example, for ensemble types, for like, uh, you know, UQ kind of, so, you know, uncertainty quantification types. We, we instantiate our BLAST kernels for things like automatic differentiation types, right, and stuff like that. Uh, then it's agnostic of layout. So you don't just need to give us, you know, a row major or column major matrix, right? We don't care, right? You can give us a matrix which is actually like a slice of a, of a tensor, of a 4D tensor, right, where you have a stride in each dimension. Uh, and it's memory space aware. So if you compile your code, you know, and I know where the data is, I can choose what kind of parallelism to use. You know, do I run it on the CPU or on the GPU based on that memory space? We can call vendor libraries if possible. So if the layout and the data type and the, and the memory space is compatible with, say, MKL or Kublas or something like that, we can call through to that and call their things. Uh, yeah. And the interface is significantly easier than typical blasts. In typical blasts, you have these, you know, like for the gem core, right? You have these, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, six integers, and you have to figure out what all these integers means, right? Because the Cocos view knows how it is strided, how large it is, and stuff like that, in Cocos kernels, you really just give, you know, the scalars and the, the views to the, to the blast call. Also, we support for some of the functions at this point um, that you can call the stuff on the team level. That means, for example, in the equivalent speak in CUDA, you can actually call BLAS inside the CUDA block and tell it, use all the threads which belong to this CUDA block to paralyze this BLAS operation. Talked a bit about Cocos tools. So, um, you know, in order to do performance optimization and stuff like that, right, we you need a bit of insight of what's going on. And Cocos Tools essentially provides that basis. So one of the things you can do is you can actually name all your parallel force, right? You can give it as first thing a string, which is kind of useful because if you ever profiled a, a you know, template abstraction-based code, you will know that uh, that gives you rather weird names for all of your functions, right? So we actually had cases where we broke profiling tools because the profiling tools somehow decided that 2,000 characters is enough for every function name. And we tell you, no, it's not. Uh, so that's, these profiling hooks, they are always there in Cocos. What happens is that you can uh, load these tools at runtime. So you set an environment variable, you point to a shared library, and what we're then gonna do is we're gonna deal open this thing and fill effectively function pointers of our profiling hooks. That means you can enable the profiling on your release uh, application. 
And for overhead of this, uh, in, you know, if you don't use the tools, it's essentially an if check on a function pointer whether it's null. And typically, even you know, if, if you happen to do that in a tight loop, right, the, the, uh, the branch predictor will essentially just eliminate that if you didn't use that tool. There's quite a few of these things you know, we have there. We have tools which do like, you know, just the simple kernel timing, et cetera. There's, there's stuff for like memory allocations and memory transfers. Uh, one nice thing there is we actually force you to name all your views. So if you do an allocating view, we force you to give it a name, uh, you know, because most people are lazy and don't name their things even if they could. But that means that you, for example, have a tool which, uh, you know, you can, you can run that tool and you see, oh, I allocated the view with that name at this address with these dimensions, and you know, the tool will tell you that. And that's something we found rather useful because it turns out that people apparently allocate and deallocate willy-nilly all over the place, uh, even if they don't need to. And if you ever tried to do that with like CUDA malloc managed, you know that that's probably a really bad performance idea. We had a guy coming to us who said, oh, my code is really, 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 really slow. I'm like, uh, we need to optimize this kernel. So the first thing is we ran was the simple kernel timer, which just gets the kernel times and said, oh, you spend 0.1% of your time inside of a parallel kernel. Like, hmm, okay, that's a problem. So we ran the memory tool, and the memory tool showed us that he allocated, deallocated, allocated, deallocated, allocated, deallocated a million times in that little unit test. Uh, it also told us what the name is. So he said, oh, that's weird. So he grabbed for the name in his code, found the thing we had allocated, and said, oh, maybe I can just hoist that allocate outside of my loop. He did that, and his allocations went, you know, 10 from a million to I don't know, 100 or something like that, and his code ran uh, on the order of 500 times faster. Okay, let's talk about a couple of things, uh, a couple of things we, we optimized, right, and this is with improved fine-grained tasking. So essentially, we already had tasking uh, available. There was a talk about that at some point, I think, I don't know, did we talk at GTC about that? Yeah, a couple of years ago. Um, and basically, this thing allows you to actually do tasking on the GPU, right? You start your task graph on the host, but you on the GPU, you have now tasks which can spawn new tasks and so on. Uh, there's this little Fibonacci example, which is essentially just an overhead test, you know, what, how fast can we do that? But what we figured is that uh, we had previously just a single, essentially a single queue, you stick stuff in and you pull stuff out. Uh, David Holman, who sits down back there, was then tasked and found, you know, that was a great idea to implement better schedulers. And so he implemented like uh, different types of different types of queues, in particular a multi-queue. So where essentially every block has kind of their own queue where they first stuck thing in and then they start stealing, you know, across the queues if necessary. Uh, and that effectively, you know, kind of uh, almost, you know, five and a half times or whatever improved the, uh, the throughput of tasks. So that gets it now in a regime where it's actually kind of viable to do things like Cholesky factorization and stuff like that with that, uh, which we hope will you know, help some of our algorithms. Here's an example code. I'll just walk you through that for a second uh, for this Fibonacci task thing. So this task essentially is getting submitted on originally on the, with a single host spawn on the, on the, on the CPU side and then uh, you know, this kernel starts with a single task. So what happens here is you go into this operator, you get yourself a scheduler from, you know, one of these arguments. Uh, now, if you're high enough up, right, you're gonna end up uh, spawning children tasks, two of them. Uh, you spawn one of them with high priority, one of them with lower priority. Next thing you do is you build yourself, you, uh, you know, both of these tasks come back with a dependency. And what now happens is, you know, the, 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 the parent task needs to wait for these things to finish, right? Because I need the results to return my own result. So what we do is we build a compound dependency, right? We combine these two dependencies into one. And then, because we, on a GPU, it's kind of hard to wait for other things to finish, right? Instead of waiting, what we do is we respawn we respawn the same task again, right? We stick ourselves into, into the queue again with that new added dependency, okay? Now, when we come back, 
we're going to enter a different branch because at this point, you know, FIP M2 and FIP M1 are not default constructed anymore. That means we already, you know, this task already went through one iteration and, and spawned these children tasks. And that way we know now we can combine these two results, you know, get the, get the previous results and make that our result. Okay, let's go to the Cocos remote spaces for a little bit. Um, so the PGAS models is something, you know, which has been floating around for quite a while. But most of these PGAS model, uh, or does anybody not know what PGAS is? Hands up. Okay, PGAS is partition global address space. So effectively it says, I want to allocate in a way that I can just access an array which is distributed over my whole cluster, potentially my whole, you know, exascale machine. And I can just index into it, right? It's something which is used, for example, for certain type of graph algorithms where you have to like globally access, you know, your petabytes of memory across the whole cluster, right? Uh, now the problem is that if you access something which isn't local to your node, you have to go over the network, right? So you actually have like a network call going on and doing stuff. And that is rather, you know, costly. Uh, now, NVIDIA came out with these DGX boxes where it starts to be maybe not quite as costly anymore. Uh, what they did is they put all these V100s together and they came up with this NV switch thing and that essentially connects every one of these GPUs to every one of these other GPUs with 300 gigabytes a second. On top of it, it's a memory fabric. So it's actually good at just accessing individual scalar types, right? Just accessing a single double somewhere. So what we thought is, oh, this sounds great. That might actually make these PGAS models, you know, reasonably fast. So in order to do that, what we did is we said, okay, we'll add a new memory space. We have a memory space abstraction for our Cocos view. So we add a new memory space. And if you allocate a view in that memory space, then it's going to be a PGAS allocation underneath. That's what this does, right? The view double star star three allocates a three-dimensional view with two runtime dimensions and one compile time dimension. Uh, with layout left, so the stride one is on the leftmost index in this new NVIDIA Schmem space. Now, what has to happen is that the operator on this view doesn't return a double. What it returns is it returns this little struct which kind of wraps a double. And if you call an operator on that struct, it actually calls a Schmem function, right? An access function which goes and grabs the memory from the the remote location. So as an example, we did the CG solve. The CG solve is essentially a, a sequence of vector adds, dot products, and the sparse matvec I showed you earlier. Right? The only place in CG solve where you actually access remote memory is on that X vector in the sparse matvec. Right? You distribute your matrix by rows across all the nodes. That means you can just loop over your local rows. But because the indices, you know, might point in that X vector to something which is not owned by you, the X vector itself has to be distributed. Uh, what we did is we compared that with an MPI version, and that MPI version is the kind of highest best optimized version we have, right? So it actually splits the metrics into inner parts and outer parts, you know, things which need to need to access remote memory and things which don't need to re access remote memory. It overlaps communication with calculations and stuff like that, right? So that's all the tricks you could potentially wish for, uh, which makes that particular version of the CG solve significantly faster than any of the things we actually have in production because all the production things don't do all these nice things. Uh, so the other thing you need to do is, uh, you know, if you know about how the MPI codes work, is uh, the only other thing other than changing the memory space on the right-hand side vector is that the matrix, instead of now storing local indices, it stores global indices. I then wrote three versions of this. The first one is using the full schmem stuff, you know, calling schmem put and so on and schmem get for every single access. I wrote a version where I inlined these functions because the, the thing NVIDIA gave me was a binary library. And that means for every single access to my right-hand side, right? So for every single flop I did, 
I called a function call, which is not inlined, which is kind of bad, right? Uh, well, surprisingly, it's not as bad as you might think. So, okay, so I said, let's inline this, and there's a thing where you can essentially get all the remote pointers. So it's instead of, you know, I stored in my view now, in my little handle, the 16 remote pointers, and then index, you know, did my own index calculation internally to figure out where the, where, what is remote and what is local. And then the last version is I made my right-hand side vector a 2D vector, and then coded the rank of where the memory is coming from in my, in my indices. Right, it's essentially just multiple, you know, did a times two billion or whatever, you know, is my, uh, or divided by two billion is my rank, right, and mod two billion is my local index, something like that. And what you see is that even the first version, right, is on four GPUs on one of these DGX boxes, is surprisingly close to, you know, only like two X or so away for the smaller examples and only like 30% slower on the, on the typical thing we would run on four GPUs. If I then inline the thing, I'm basically back with this really simple version, you know, no MPI, no communication explicitly in there, right? It doesn't know anything. It looks like the, the you know, effectively ser serial GPU code, right, with a non-distributed code. And I'm almost there. And if I then do the, uh, encode the rank in the column index in order to not have, you know, arbitrary divides, uh, integer divides and mod operations for every single uh, flop I do, then I can actually beat the previous, you know, this original MPI version uh, on the smallest problems. Okay, um, a couple more minutes. Cocos-based projects, uh, we are running production code right now. We have about 12 codes, you know, of that size, 300,000, 500,000 lines of code, which are running actual analysis nowadays. We have about 30 of those kind of codes which are committed to porting, right, which essentially said, yeah, this is what we're gonna do, and we are porting over, right, that's like 15 million lines of code or something. Uh, there's never, you know, if you just call, so in DOE land, you know, count like projects with PIs, uh, we are probably at about 50 of these packages, which, you know, uh, which we're doing. And uh, there's probably around 100-ish projects which have been experimenting and starting, you know, looking at using Cocos and actually, you know, came to like our boot camps. We had about 500 developers going through at least a full day training at this point. So this is a pretty serious effort. Here's, you know, a number of institutions which have users with Cocos, right? Most of the national labs are on there. There's quite a few, you know, uh, external partners like CSCS, you know, the Swiss Supercomputing Center, Jülich, uh, Technische Universität Munich. Uh, there's the CA on there, which is the French atomic nuclear, uh, you know, things. But let me show you some examples. So this is, this is Uinter. It's a thing, you know, developed at Utah University. It's, uh, it's a big, like, you know, system-wide tasking kind of thing, but where they have, like, you know, a certain number of codes sitting on top of that. Uh, for example, a, uh, like a combustion uh, radiation kind of simulation. They already had a CPU and a GPU version of their code, but we said, oh, this is too hard to maintain all these different versions. So what we're gonna do is we write, rewrite this in Cocos, and we did. And what we found is that the CPU code sped up by almost 2x, which was, uh, we found rather surprising. Uh, and the GPU code was also faster than what it was before. Main reasons for the speed up on the CPU are typically, Cocos is a more restrictive programming model than a lot of programming models. For example, we don't allow you to use, uh, you know, stood vectors in our parallel for loops, right, because both don't work on GPUs necessarily. And in particular, it doesn't work if you try to do pushback. So, you know, things like reallocations in loops, in parallel loops, doesn't work, right, and actually Cocos will prevent you from compiling that for the most part. Uh, and it turns out that if you, you know, get rid of allocations in your parallel loops, your code goes faster. That is a rather common thing. So every, essentially every one of the series production codes we had, after we started switching over to Cocos, with Cocos serial backend, right? So we just run in MPI with like the Cocos serial backend on their CPU platforms. Uh, the average speed up is probably somewhere around 2.5x after we rewrote that. Uh, which, you know, most of these code teams were very happy to see. <laughs> Another example, LEMS, that's a code which I think Jensen actually mentioned in his keynote. Uh, it's a 
widely used molecular dynamics codes, mostly focused on material physics. So that's a bit different than, you know, like, uh, like Gromax and Ember and NMD and stuff, which are, you know, very focused and actually better and faster for like bio simulations. Um, the difference here is that LAMPS has over 500 physics modules. So I talked to the NMD developers and they said we had to port like five or six kernels to GPUs in order to make the code work fast. Uh, in order to get 90% of, you know, the kind of combinations of stuff people run, you know, 90% of the simulations people run, we have to port about 450 of these kernels. Right. Um, Cocos covers a growing subset of those. It's not everything. One of the things it covers is something important to us, Rex. Uh, this Rex code is rather complicated. So the original version of this was 10,000 lines of code, right, just for that one physics kernel. Um, the Cocos version is about 6,000. As a comparison, you know, something you often see as examples for, uh, for, for molecular dynamics is Leonard Jones, which is about 200 lines of code, if you take everything in, right? This is used for shock simulations. And what we compared here is we compared something like 196,000 atoms for 100 time steps. Uh, and I ran that on four like Trinity nodes, which is like, you know, eight Intel Haswell sockets, uh, four IBM power nodes, uh, which is again, eight, you know, power nine sockets, eight ARM, V8 sockets, that's the Astra, you know, the Thunder X2 uh, thing, four NVIDIA K40s, four NVIDIA P100, and four NVIDIA V100. What you see is first that the vanilla version, the original version, is slower than the Cocos versions on the CPUs, right? And then when you hit like uh, P100s and V100s, uh, you're faster. You know, every one of these GPUs replaces like three, three-ish sockets of uh, your CPUs, right? So a single G. In other words, you know, one of the Sierra nodes or would be equivalent to like uh, you know six nodes or something on our other supercomputers and the summit nodes would be more like, you know, nine-ish because we have more GPUs. Alexa is a portable perform, uh, for shock hydrodynamics uh, application, uh, solving, you know, multi-material problems. Uh, and, you know, again, what you see is, you know, we get roughly kind of the kind of performance you would expect, right? The P100s are faster than the Kepler cards. Uh, a P100 is, you know, faster than the dual socket kind of of Xeon, you know, so that one of these GPUs is about, you know, four, uh, four sockets of CPUs. That's kind of what we see for most of these things. Um, another example, Spark, is a, a hydrodynamics, uh, aerodynamics code uh, for, in particular, hypersonic uh, problems. And uh, all these different numbers here is essentially the kind of different supercomputers we have. Uh, important thing is, uh, that this ATS2, this blue line down there, that's, that's Sierra. And uh, effectively, you now eight of these Sierra nodes are roughly, as of 32 GPUs, are equivalent to uh, 80 nodes of Trinity, the, the CPU-based uh, supercomputer we have, which would be, you know, 160 Haswell uh, sockets. Okay. Where do we go with this? We're aligning this with Cocos C++ standard. So what we are trying to do is we're proposing features for the C++ standard. We are now planning to backport features to, pre, you know, to the compilers we actually can use. So if we get something into C++ 20, right, uh, but only our compilers only support C++ 11, then you know, that's not gonna be very helpful for a long time. So we start backporting these things. And then what we're gonna do is we replace features, you know, we got in, we move the, the kind of little different syntax out into a Cocos legacy thing, that's the plan, and then put that on top of, you know, whatever the, the C++ standard uh, thing looks like. Couple of features there, Atomic Ref is the atomic support we have that uh, pro provides atomics, you know, like the atomics in Cocos, so you can do atomic operations on non-atomic things, you know, like in OpenMP. Uh, atomic Ref will work for everything, more or less, so you can actually do atomic operations on structs as long as we have the correct operators defined. Right. So this is not just log-free atomics. Another thing is Cocos View, that's becoming MD span. So that's gonna have all these little fancy things, right? You have layouts and you have accessors which allow you to introduce, you know, things like the texture fetches or even PGAS and stuff like that underneath. Uh, so all of these things will work there. And we are working on executors and basic linear algebra. So the basic linear algebra is something we just started design work. 
how do we want to align with this executor stuff? So one of the things which is coming up in Cocos we are gonna work over the next year or so on is we are starting to go to more asynchronous -y. Uh What do we need for that? First is we need uh, introduction of execution space instances. So things like CUDA streams, for example, are working actually already now. How does that work? You essentially take an execution space and you partition it into you know, multiple ones like, you know, kind of like streams. And then you can give our execution policies one of these stream or, you know, one of these execution space instances and say, oh, here, run here, right? And then you have to wait for all of them or individual ones. Uh, and that allows you essentially this CUDA stream programming model. In the future, uh, these things return futures or future-like things. And that means you can build essentially dependency graphs of uh, these things. And that aligns with very well with where, what CUDA just did with the CUDA graph stuff, right? So one of the things we would do is we would put that then on top of like CUDA graphs. I think I'm kind of out of time now, uh, but that's good because I'm also done. Uh, you can find a lot of other information, you know, on GitHub with all our repositories and stuff like that and documentation. Uh, there's, you know, presentations downloaded at our site, and there's actually quite a bit of stuff on demand on GDC because apparently we have been coming here quite a bit and talking about things. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>